semester and a half left, I believe. And uh, yeah, so I, I put it all to try and stay in school. Depleted my savings, and then I remember the exact moment I was at literally six or seven dollars. And uh, the guy at the gym, you know, uh, owned a restaurant, and that's where my wife worked. He was feeding me. Uh, I was training and I was eating there, you know. My name is Joe Selecki. I'm a seven and two professional fighter out of Salted Dog Jiu-Jitsu in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm fighting on this upcoming season of Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series, and my fight will be on July 9th in Vegas. My name's Chris Brennan, the West Side Strangler. Um, I have uh, 36 pro fights, 21 wins, 19 by submission, uh, one knockout. I fought for the UFC, I fought for Pride, I fought for King of the Cage, um, I fought all over the world. My upbringing was a little strange. Um, I was born in Compton, California. Um, grew up between Compton, then to Huntington Beach, California, and then to a nicer area like Laguna Hills, Mission Viejo area. Um, my my family was a little shady, so it uh, e even when we moved into the nicer area, we, we still weren't uh, capable of living in the nicer area. Uh, I never trained martial arts until the day after UFC won. Um, I was bouncing at a bar with Todd Medina and Chemo and some other guys, and uh, we saw the first UFC on TV that night and sought out somewhere to train the next day. I had not seen it at all before that, and I was tripping out because at that time I was bodybuilding, I was around 220, and I was watching Hoist, you know, kind of uh, run everybody over in the tournament, and he was about 175 pounds, and so that was the first time I had seen it, and I figured, these guys are fighting, they're getting paid, they're not getting arrested, this is right up my alley. So when it originally came out, The Ultimate Fighter, and now, you know, more so Dana White Contender Series, there's all these new available opportunities to jump a level. So you're, you're on the regional scene, and then all of a sudden, you have this fight against another regional fighter, and one of you is gonna get the opportunity to get a contract, and, and the other one's not. And so, it's an incredibly stressful time. Like, there's a lot of pressure involved with that. And so a lot of fighters have big decisions to make. Some of them, you know, want to trust what they've been doing and other individuals want to increase. And for each fighter, there may be a different answer. And so finally you have that one opportunity to, to take that shot and to get to that next level and to hopefully move into a place where you can be a stable professional athlete over the long term. Three fight before in Brazil, there we don't call MMA, you call it Vale Tudo. We fight for honor. We don't fight for money, for, for nothing. You have one school, don't like the other school, then I need to, I need to protect my, my banner. And this is my, my three first fight. Then I come to the US and I did a couple fight in close the door. And the guy liked my style, and I fight my first time in UFC 8. 6'8", 400 pounds, big, big dude. What, what's going through your mind when you go in there? Yeah, then my, my daughter does born six or eight months before the fight. When I saw the guy, I have a daughter for take. I want to go home. Yeah, before, of course, you'll be nervous, you'll be something new for me. Three fights in one night, and we don't have gloves. And the, 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 the 14, he started to put the gloves in two divisions. One below 200 pounds, 220, and one over 220. I fight one below 220. Brother was like actually old enough to play sports and stuff, and he was playing baseball. 
and uh, he wasn't getting any playing time. We moved to a new town or whatever, and it was just it was just a whole new thing. So my parents wanted to throw him in something individual, so they threw him in karate. Uh, that was 1999, so like jiu-jitsu was just starting to maybe catch fire a little bit, and uh, the instructor that was teaching the karate program got his blue belt in jiu-jitsu, which back then you know was pretty solid. So he saw the effectiveness of it, and he switched the whole school over. They just started doing only jiu-jitsu. So by the time I started, um, I just started learning jiu-jitsu day one. And thankfully, my parents didn't really know the difference. They thought we were getting into karate. You know, you had the gi, and there was structure. So they just assumed it was traditional martial arts. And I've uh, been doing jiu-jitsu ever since. I never took a break. Joe Selecki, um, have been watching him for a long time, and it's really exciting to see his growth within MMA. And right away he had a very high level grappling pedigree and a lot of people don't understand that not only is he a good grappler in mma but he could have been elite in grappling on the grappling circuit if he wanted to right the wins that he had coming up through the ranks but his grappling was always built really well for mma he always had great back attacks and those have only gotten better he has a great guillotine he has great pressure he has great wrestling and his wrestling has only gotten better in the area he is one of the most renowned guys not just for his abilities but for his work ethic there's very few individuals who have worked as hard as he has as consistently as he has from like six to 16 i won no tournaments you know that's not like a joke you know i'd win like a, maybe a match here or there but i was absolutely terrible so much so to like I remember my last Naga I did as a teen, my dad was like, we're not coming to these anymore. Like, we can't spend this money on the tournament and going here and traveling and all that if you're gonna get you know, finished in less than a minute and then that's our day. You know? So uh, yeah, it was actually terrible. But then I knew the techniques, I studied it a lot, I love Jiu Jitsu, but um, it took a while for my body to catch up with my mind. And I got a phone call um I had just out of nowhere uh, from a promoter that asked me if I'd be interested because knew I was a boxer, or be interested of uh, just jumping in the <laughs> cage and fighting. That's a, literally how it happened. You know, I wasn't really looking or anything, and I was running nightclubs years before this. Uh, I had uh, um, I was running a nightclub, and Tim Sylvia was one of the doormen at my nightclub, and uh, I was training the door guys. Um, because, you know, I felt as though to be a doorman, you got to be able to handle yourself. And Tim at that time was a semi-pro uh, football player, you know, giant guy, you know, uh, 345 pounds or so at that time. But uh, didn't really have the, you know, the dexterity, the mechanics for, for fighting. And uh, from there, started training with me, went to some of the... They're really quiet, hush-hush events that nobody talks about. So there's a lot of fights that Tim had that you wouldn't see on any record because they weren't collecting that information. So he fought in Pancrase and stuff like that and these garages and, and stuff uh, all over New England. And um, from there, uh, went to a UFC event and met Pat Militich and that's how Tim uh, went out to Bentendorf, Iowa to be a sp uh, sparring partner. Pat Militic, um, my nemesis. The guy was, he's my toughest opponent, um, the hardest to beat. He, he makes you fight his fight. And so for me, he was my fourth, my fifth, and my seventh fight. And I was his 24th, 25th, and 27th fight. So he had a lot more experience than I did. He had wrestled in college and had a, was already like a, a kickboxing champ. You know, and I had done nothing. I was a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, and, and I trained a little bit of boxing. When I fought Militich the third time was in the UFC, and I was sitting in the stands, I was an alternate, and I had already fought one time against Courtney Turner, and I armbarred him, and then I was sitting in the stands not thinking I was gonna get into the tournament because uh, uh, it was only a four-man tournament, so people had only had to fight one time to get to the finals, but then Mikey Burnett and Eugenio Tadao fought, and they killed each other, and Mike and Burnett broke his hand and whatever. So I ran down from the bleachers in, in the arena to start to warm up, and Peretti was running down the hall, Brennan, warm up! And I'm, I'm like, I, I am, I am. And as I start warming up, I realize it's Pat Militich I'm fighting again, who I just fought you know, two months before and two months before that. My name's Casey Selecki, and I am Joe Selecki's wife. Him and all the guys from the gym would come in after training and eat dinner. And <clears throat> for probably three months, he came in, sat at my bar, ordered a water, 
ordered a salad with an elk burger on top, no tomatoes and ranch dressing, literally four times a week for months. And I had no, I just never picked up on it. Took a fight probably three weeks into our relationship. Being up in New Jersey, um, I trained in New Jersey from when I was six to 18, uh, or almost 19. And uh, we had an MMA class there, so we would put on little gloves and do jiu-jitsu, or we'd start on the feet and, you know, spar, but uh, I didn't really have any formal kickboxing or boxing training. So, you know, it was basically just not get hit, shoot it, and take them down. And really, my MMA training, like, formally started outside of a, ran a couple random sparring or pad sessions was uh, seven weeks before my first amateur fight. So. Uh, it was kind of like a crash course in keeping your hands up and not throwing the world's worst punches. And then seven weeks later, I was in a cage, uh, you know, fighting a real fight. The first one's the easiest one because you don't know what to expect. You know, I, I was doing really well in jiu-jitsu at that point. I was coming off a, a couple big wins and I had a lot of momentum and I had so much support and it was a hometown fight. I don't even think I, I grasped how scary getting in a cage with somebody else was and the crowd yelling and all that. It was just so exciting, I didn't even think about it. Now the second one on, yeah, the, the nerves started kicking in. The first one was really nothing, it was just exciting. Yeah, my first fight, I was called, uh, asked me if I'd be interested in stepping into the cage and fighting a guy who was a uh, Golden Gloves uh, boxer from New Jersey, but he was also a All-American wrestler from Montclair uh, University. So. And I said, yeah, and so uh, ended up uh, stopping him in the, I think the first round, I can't remember, but by TKO, it caught him with the left hand right off the bat, uh, came out like a righty, and then I switched to a lefty, and threw a uh, straight left, knocked him down, jumped on him, and just pounded him out, and that was it, it was my first fight. Um, the promoter, was a friend of mine. He got me a fight. This was an amateur fight. It was in a very, very small town. And the this is when the, the, first, the commissions first started and everything, you know, like the, the fight scene was still very low or very young. Uh, for whatever reason, the doctor didn't show up or the ambulance or something, right? Somebody didn't show up. So the commission's like, look, you know, you can't put these fights on. Well, the promoter is like, well, screw you, I'm putting the fights on. You know, I got my friends here. Um, you know, we're, we're having this fight, whether you like it or not. The commission's like, well, you're gonna get suspended. You know, you're never gonna put on fights again or, or for however long, right? Anyway, so he said, I'm putting on the fights. Well, so now the commission's like, okay, well, we're leaving. We're, we're not having no part of this. You know, this is illegal or, or whatever. You know, I don't remember, but regardless, there's no commission. Um, so I'm warming up, uh, well the locker room was the gas station bathroom and then I'm warming up like in the gravel, you know, next to the gas station and uh, this dude, you know, that I'm fighting, he's just staring me down, he's calling me names and stuff, you know, he's like, here, he's like, I'm gonna fuck you up and all this. So anyway, so I get in there and fight, um, first round takes me down, puts me against the fence, cuts me open with an elbow, you know, this is an amateur fight, you, you know, the, weren't technically supposed to elbow but again there's no commission like I knew the referee he's like he's he's like whatever just go fight right um, you know he's called me names he's like you're a f I remember him he kept saying I said you're all f I'm gonna fuck you up you know cut me open a couple times you know get up in between rounds and you know I looked at the ref and you know I, like I said I knew the ref and he's like you know, I was, I was, I didn't even have a corner or anything. So he, he comes over and helped me with the water. Um, you know, gave, gave me a little bit of water. And while he's giving me some water, he's like, he goes, uh, he goes, hey man, whatever you want to do, man, it's a free for all. You know, he's like, you don't have to, you know, play by the rules. You know, he's like, fuck this guy, right? This is the ref telling me this while he's giving me water. And uh, so the second round comes out, the dude shoots in. I sprawled real good. Uh, stood up and just soccer kicked the fuck out of his face, man. Just stomping him, <laughs> and the ref was was like, you know, what I mean, I kind of looked over at him like right before I did it, and he's like, go ahead. <laughs> did you win? Yeah, so I ended up stomping his face in, you know, with. Is that on your record? Uh, probably no. Nah. I only got like, there's only I think there's only one amateur fight on my record. I was on a trajectory. I mean, I had uh, five amateur fights, all first round finishes, three pro fights at that time, all first round finishes. So. Um, 
you go in and, uh, you know, I think fear is a lot of times from the unknown, you know what I mean? So uh, I hadn't seen anything. I had been in the cage as a pro for like six minutes going into my fourth fight, which is nothing, you know? Uh, so going into that fight, I went out there, I, I took the, uh, my opponent down who was on paper, you know, he had a lot of wrestling experience compared to me. Uh, I took him down twice, took his back, had his back the whole round, had a choke on like every other fight I've ever been in. And uh, he gutted it out, and it not even necessarily defended, he just stayed in it and didn't go out and didn't tap. And uh, I came out for round two, I wasn't tired, but my arms and legs weren't working from, from that adrenaline dump of thinking you're gonna win. And it was, I call it like a, almost like an outer body experience where you're just like, you're there, you're present, but my arms aren't working, my legs aren't working. And I remember just being there like, okay, like I can't quit, you know, I, I'm not gonna quit. And uh, I guess this is my life for the next 10 minutes is this beating and I'm just watching. I mean, there's a highlight of it somewhere where he's just smacking me with overhands and head kicks and elbows and you're cut and you're bleeding. And you know, I was trying to win the fight at all costs, but I could feel in my arms and legs, there was nothing there. Even if I, even if I hit him, nothing was gonna happen, you know? And uh, went in the back, went to the hospital after that because the promotion made us and we spent eight hours there. It was just me and uh, my best friend and my wife. And man, it was an absolute heartbreaker because you know, I, I, we talked about this a little bit before, but I, I can deal with letting myself down. But when you let other people down and they took the trip up from South Carolina to there and, you know, you ruined their good time and, and, and you let everybody down, you know? And uh, yeah, I, on the way home, I just remember looking at all kinds of people that I look up to as topology records, trying to see guys that lost a fight before they made it to the bigger shows. Cause I was convinced that that was the end of the world and I'd never amount to anything. And I had to go get a full-time job and, you know, um, and it took me a little while to come back from that, but I was back in the gym on Monday, but my mindset didn't recover probably till after my next fight. Damn. And he asked me for some footage of uh, my ring of combat fight, which was my fight before last. And uh, I couldn't get it to send, and I'm like technologically illiterate. And uh, he was like pressuring, like, hey man, send it, send it, send it. And then he sent me a, a message from Sean Shelby. He sent a list of guys he had eligible in February, and then Sean Shelby answered him back uh, that morning. You know, it was in April. so. Uh, asking for footage of my last two fights. So and he said, don't get your hopes up, but let's hope for the best, you know? So we were thinking I was gonna be fighting in June at CFFC and then uh, he, I got to the gym on a Monday night. He sent me the text, he said, you're on the Contender Series. Uh, this is the date, this is the opponent. Basically, I dropped my phone and ran from the mat room into the gym side, like a little girl, my arms flailing, screaming, and I was high-fiving John. And I was like, I got it, and uh, that's it. And then uh, the next week we went out to Vegas for pre-production and now we're here training. Look at the Contender Series, it's just like anything else in combat sports through all of history. Big opportunities carry big risk. To endure, this is a fight game. You have, to, you have to want it bad enough to endure the loss and keep going and, and endure the training. You're gonna get injured, you're gonna get, you know, staph infections, ringworm. You know, the fight game, it's not gonna give you, it's not a storybook, because it can't be a storybook for everybody. You're gonna hurt yourself. You're gonna lose fights, you're gonna win fights, you're gonna travel into these dungeons of shows and, and like in these bathrooms you're gonna warm up in, you're gonna go out, you're not gonna make any money. That's how bad your opponent wants to win. That's how bad his coaches and fans want him to win. You have to endure all of that and you have to like find a, a crappy job that's gonna like give you the freedom and schedule to be able to, to train full time because if you're not training full time, you're not gonna make it. Like not everyone gets to win every time. And as bad as you want yourself to win, as bad as you want your friends and training partners to win. These guys in Brazil, like this is all they do. These guys are coming up as kids, four years old, training jiu-jitsu. Now they're 25 and they're in the UFC and you gotta compete with that. So you have to train double time. You can't have a real job, you gotta just go. 50% of the time you have to go home disappointed, you know, in, in terms of the fighters on the card. Then, if you are lucky enough to have a coach who, who gets you that chance, or a manager that slips you in and gives you the opportunity, you have to take advantage of that opportunity to get into the UFC. You gotta win that contender fight. You gotta win that Ultimate Fighter show. And if you truly wanna be somebody special in fighting. You have to win that first fight in the UFC, and then you get a contract. But guess what the contract is? It's nothing, it's 10,000 and 10,000 to fight. Now some of you may be watching this and thinking that's a lot of money, but think about that. If you fought once or twice a year, you're making as much as an entry person at a regular job, right? And, but you're getting hurt every day. You're getting, you have the, the risk of dying. You have the risk of hurting yourself, breaking your neck, breaking your ankle, your knee, surgeries, 
you're gonna go through all of this for those pennies, right? You have to be willing to invest more than the other person. You have to be willing to have faith in the darkest times more than the other person. And if you win all three fights, if you're able to win those first three fights or even two of the three fights, then you get a second contract. And you know what the second contract's probably gonna be? 20 grand and 20 grand, okay? So now if you're healthy enough and the stars align, and you're able to fight three times in a year. At this level of training, it's hard to fight three times a year because you get hurt. If Every single person who's coming through, there's no easy path to get where you're going. If you're able to do that, then, then still, that's 40 grand, 40 grand, 40 grand. You'll make 120,000 minus taxes, minus manager fees, coaches fees. Now you're making 80, 90,000. Again, people are making that out of college. People are making that out of the first couple of years of, of, of going. If you win those three fights or two of those three fights, then you maybe now, you start making a couple hundred thousand a year, which is, you know, I, what I would consider, you know, you're getting more wealthy, you're getting more affluent. And there's somebody else who wants it just as bad as you, so you have to find a way to want it that little bit more. But you have to endure all of that. So you, if you don't love it, and if this isn't your goal to make it to the top of that, you won't endure all that and you're not gonna make it. Tell me what your dad does. Um, he kicks people's butts. My name is Adley Edwards, I'm 29 years old. Hard to be really good at something, and be good at a lot of things. You have to put everything in, a, in one basket. Uh, do you want Chris to win the fight? <laughs> and I looked at my brother, I was like, man, I knew they did that shit over here. Spent a lot of time making sure that he's prepared because you never want to say like, oh, we could have done this, or we should have done that. It was just like all the air in your lungs was just let go. I mean, I worked so hard for this. When will else in my life will I have a chance to get cornered by Hoist and fight in Kazakhstan? I think um, the call was weird because you never know with Adley. Um, he he had mentioned something had happened but he wanted to wait till he got home. I think he was around people. That very moment, that, that, that split second, I knew it was all over.